we don't even recognize that that's a factor that our horse is already kind of built in with the training process understand that there's little benefit to them just to them moving and offering behaviors that they should take the opportunity just to hang out and not do anything until they're asked to do something else so that kind of gets built into to traditional training but with um, clicker training and positive reinforcement this isn't necessarily inherently built in and actually the opposite is more likely to happen where the horse is very enthusiastic about the training process and is extremely engaged and wants to offer more because they want to do more they want to they want to do the behaviors that you know that will um, result in reinforcement so they're constantly wanting to offer behaviors there. I'm glad you're back for another episode of the TWE podcast. If the audio is a little bit off, I apologize. I'm usually driving in my car when I record these episodes, so I try and keep them as clean as possible, but sometimes I can't help it. (laughs) Hopefully this episode is really helpful and inspires either, um, questions or just a thought process. And I would love to hear back from you about how this podcast episode or my podcast episodes in general have impacted your life and your relationship with your horse. If you feel like you'd like to share, you can always check out more information about the willing equine on my website, the willing equine.com, where I talk about different things on my blog. I share about my social media platforms, and I also offer training services and things like my foundation foundation course, which runs every three months. So if you'd like to learn more, head to my website. Otherwise, keep listening or actually, you know what, wait till after the episode to check out my website um, because I would love for you to listen to this episode and I'd love to hear back from you on it. So keep listening and I hope you enjoy. So let's talk about balance. Balance in training, balance in you know, training individual behaviors. So like finding a balance within a behavior, um, finding balance in emotions and, you know, the mental state of the horse balance in ourselves and our expectations balance in the time we spend with our horses. Are we, uh, in as far as training goes and non-training time. And I mean, honestly, we could talk about balance in almost every area of our relationship with horses and our training with horses. So this is kind of a broad subject. It's kind of multifaceted and has a lot of different areas that you could apply this idea of balance. And so balance is a little, it's it's individual, it's subjective. So it's subjective to the individual's needs, what balance looks like for them. So for example, um, I have, Well, I guess I should start off with looking at more of the general concept of balance and in a training relationship aspect as a whole with our horses. So a really easy place to start looking at this is when I'm working with horses, I like to try and balance the time that I spend with my horses outside of training and the time I spend with horses in a formal training environment. So you really can't ever not be interacting and training and learning and and, and impacting your horse's behavior in one way or another. We may not be in a formal training environment. We may not be trying to teach something like a backup or a Spanish walk or a trot transition or a flying lead change or whatever. We may not actively be teaching one of those things, but we are still engaging with and our horses are still learning from us and we are learning from them and we are impacting their behavior in one way or another every time we are interacting with our horses. There's not a single time that this is not happening. I, I can find it. I can, I can find it if you point it out and tell me we're not doing any training here. Like I can find it. Um, and that's just the way that, that it works. That's just the way we're always learning. We're always absorbing information. We're always putting out information and we're just, it's like this give and take process all the time. So I like to differentiate this idea between a formal training session and a no expectation time. That's kind of what my little term for it is, but you could call it like, um, you know, downtime, or you could call it like relationship time, or you could 
like casual time, like you can call it anything you want. It doesn't really matter. There's just the formal training time, the time that we are actively working on shaping a certain behavior and we have certain expectations for what it's going to look like and we have a shaping plan and all of that. And then there's the times where we just want to hang out with our horse, right? We just want to chill with them in the pasture, maybe read a book, maybe groom, something like that. And uh, so I call this like a no expectation time. Now grooming, you know, asking your horse to stand still while being groomed could be more, you know, that's, that's depending on the horse and their, re, their, their feelings towards being groomed. Like some horses really don't like being groomed. And so I would actually be doing a formal training to that process would be a formal training experience, you know, getting them used to being groomed and creating that positive association with being groomed. Um, so that wouldn't be a no expectation time, but for some horses who really enjoy being groomed and just, just soak it up and would just stand there all day for it, you could consider that just like a relationship bonding time and a no expectation time. You're not shaping a new behavior. You're not, it's not very formalized. It's just kind of like, we're, I'm just going to groom on you and we're just going to spend this time together. So it really depends on the horse, but you get the idea of how we can have a, uh, a formal time and then like a no expectation time. And, and like I said, no expectation time for me is like I go out into the pasture and maybe I'll sit on the hay bale while all the other horses are, all the horses are gathered around, or maybe I'll just be petting on them or, or maybe we're just sitting in the field together. I'm reading a book or I'm sitting in the little tree fort thing we have in the pasture or, um, if it's horses that like being groomed and maybe we're doing this big kind of co-grooming mutual scratching fest type thing, um, that would be considered a no expectation time in our relationship. Again, the horses are always learning. They're always uh, taking in information from us. So like in, I, I'll use grooming as an example. So we could say, sure, it's a no expectation time, but if my horse is standing really close to me and I back up a step, well, they're standing really close to me while I'm scratching on them. And then I back up a step and I stop scratching on them and they move closer to me and I start scratching again because I'm like, oh, they're asking to be scratched more. Guess what I've just done? I've reinforced the stepping closer to me and taught them that if they move closer to me, then I will start scratching again. So sure, it was a no expectation time. We weren't in a formal training session in our own mind, but they were learning. They're still learning and we're learning too because we're learning that when our horses step into us that they are asking for more scratches and we can um, we can discourage the continuation of stepping closer and closer to us by starting the scratching up again. So there's like all of these different variations, these different aspects that go into the relationship all the time, a communication, a flowing communication back and forth all the time, even in non-formal training sessions. But I do think that it's really healthy to spend time with, I guess you could even say lower expectation time maybe, or less for, or un, informal training sessions. Like maybe it's formal versus informal or something like that. And it, balancing your time with your horse between those two can really, it can really benefit your relationship with your horse. Because if one of the things I see quite a bit of, and this shows up in my own horses too, because I always feel so short on time <laughs> that I just, um, I just show up and I train and then I have to move on to the next horse and I train that one and then I leave and go home and I, I spend way less time just chilling with them than I spend training. So every time I show up, they are expecting, rightfully so, to have a very active and engaged training session with a lot of uh, reinforcement and a very set criteria and shaping plans and all that, which they seem very actively participating in and they seem very... Um, like it's, they seem to really enjoy it, but it creates this high performance experience. So like in our relationship where they are constantly kind of expecting that every time I'm around that that's what we're going to be doing. And so if I would just go in and just start scratching on them, or I just want to sit on the hay bale and hang with them, they get frustrated and confused because that's not what they're used to. There's not that balance there. It's weighs heavily, heavily on the formal training side and that's what they're expecting. So developing that balance can really help in your everyday life and help your horse to understand that sometimes we just hang and sometimes we have a formal training session and it can really help horses that get overly amped up about training sessions and you know everything has to be so structured and formal and and um, 
they, you know, you can't even walk into your pasture gate without your horse going, okay, what, let's go, let's go, let's go, right? So spending more time with your horse, just hanging in with them, just chilling, it can help balance out those expectations and balance out that relationship your horse has with you so that they start to understand that sometimes we're just relaxing and sometimes we're training. The other aspect we can take this um, balance idea into is uh, the balance between for like motive and the what's the right word like higher energy behaviors like forward moving behaviors and stationary behaviors so the lower energy behaviors I find that especially when a lot of people start clicker training and start working with positive reinforcement as I think it's a little bit of a hangover from the traditional days where you know the horses just in because of the way that the training works because horses learn not to do anything unless the cues, so the negative reinforcement cues are applied, um, and they learn not to do anything else, not to offer behaviors. It, I think we ignore, not ignore, we don't even recognize that that's a factor, that our horses already kind of built in with the training process, understand that there's little benefit to them, just to them moving and offering behaviors, that they should take the opportunity just to hang out and not do anything until they're asked to do something else. So that kind of gets built into to traditional training, but with um, clicker training and positive reinforcement, this isn't necessarily inherently built in and actually the opposite is more likely to happen where the horse is very enthusiastic about the training process and is extremely engaged and wants to offer more because they want to do more. They, wanna, they want to do the behaviors that, you know, that will, um, Result in reinforcement, so they're constantly wanting to offer behaviors. So we can get really enthusiastic and excited about this and spend a lot of time in clicking and rewarding for motivated behaviors. So, like movement behaviors, walking, trotting, cantering, um, you know, Spanish walks, like all these fun and exciting behaviors that in themselves are fantastic behaviors, but when not, when they aren't balanced, when there's no um, counter training, so training with standing still, teaching them that standing still is equally as reinforced, that it's equally as valuable to them, that they will um, receive lots and lots of reinforcement for standing still if we don't spend as much time reinforcing the standing still behaviors, then we're going to quickly find ourselves in a situation where our horse only wants to move and then we have a horse that will not stand still. So I spend a lot of time, you know, as I mentioned, reinforcing standing still. <laughs> standing still, stationary targeting, stationary cones, stationary, you know, everything. Um, I want my horses to understand that waiting, standing, you know, being still, being quiet as far as their feet and you know offering behaviors and such is going to be just as valuable to them as movement behaviors otherwise we can end up with this just recipe for disaster with this thousand pound animal that won't stop moving right and that's just sounds terrible to anybody who's um just been around that where the horse is just won't stop they won't stop circling you they won't stop offering behaviors like Spanish walk or or backing up or looking for food or whatever it just this is what gives a lot of positive reinforcement training such a bad reputation is or not such a bad because it's doing great but um, it can give it a bad reputation because if you're not aware of this need, the need to balance behaviors, the need to reinforce standing still and being quiet with their feet and, and offering behaviors and such, then you can create a very anxious, unbalanced horse where the horse just never stops moving, is just constantly offering behaviors, it's just constantly out of control it feels like and it can overwhelm the handler and the horse can start to get frustrated because the handler's having a hard time keeping up and it just like I said recipe for disaster so I spent a lot of time reinforcing uh, what I call a default so teaching my horses to wait to be cued for a behavior and this helps especially when they work with students or 
people who come and do immersive training programs with me or at clinics or whatever my horses learn that waiting patiently next to the human results in being cued for something which results in being reinforced and it just is such a fluid and nice it makes for a fluid and nice training session which everybody wants right so um like I said, so I spent a lot of time doing that and it can really help. I think our horses, it can help them feel. It seems like, I mean, I can't tell you how a horse feels right, but I can, um, I can tell you that, you know, their behavior, I can tell you by watching their behavior, what it seems like they're experiencing, obviously without like having, you know, some sort of like helmet on them where I'm like reading their brain waves and like all that. And even then that only tells us to a certain extent, right? I can't tell you how your horse feels. I can't say for sure one thing or another, but we can read their body language. We can look at, you know, what, how does a horse behave on an everyday basis? And then how do they behave in this training session? Um, and we can kind of make a basic assessment off of that. So horses that have been taught that standing still is also reinforced and also very valuable to them appear to be way more relaxed in the training. And to me, this, this seems like the horses are more balanced, not only physically because they are learning that standing still is good and moving is good, but they also seem to be more balanced emotionally and mentally. They're not so frantic and wound up and their emotions seem to be more, um, more relaxed. Like they are just enjoying the training session as is rather than waiting for the next opportunity to do something else. And then just like, Oh my God, what's happening? What's happening? What's happening? Right. It just becomes this, uh, like just out of control and it's so overwhelming to be around and it just looks really stressful for the horse. And I don't, I don't want my horses to be stressed like that. I want them to enjoy the training process. So balancing behaviors is important. Again, it's spending time bouncing between like, can we do some trot transitions? Now can we stand here quietly? Okay, now can we do go over these jumps? Okay, great. Can now can we work on just standing next to me or a stationary target or a stand stay or something like that? And then, okay, great. Now can we do some reverse round penning? And we just go back and forth and back and forth like that. So they create a balance in the behaviors that they learn. The other aspect we can go into is with the emotional balance um, is trainer skill. So this is less about what you're teaching your horse to do and rather how you're addressing the training process in that your focus becomes on helping your horse to experience a positive training experience. So experiencing your trauma, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, that they're experiencing something that is balanced, that they are not over the top, stressing out, frantic about trying to find the right answer. But they're also not so just blase that they don't care that the food you have is just like, meh, whatever. I don't really care about that food or I don't really care about the training session or, you know, this training is uninteresting to me and we're just like this kind of either uninterested or I've also seen where people have trained their horses into kind of this like almost seems like a dead robot, right? We don't want that either. We want this balance between a horse that is in control of themselves and of their physical actions and they understand what's expected of them and they're calm and focused, but they're also active participants in the training session and they are enthusiastic and willing to try new things and willing to explore new behaviors and they're not angry about it or frustrated or confused and we want this we want this eagerness without frantic frustration and we want eagerness that can't be found in just this dead robot like doesn't want to offer any behaviors and would just rather not be here, right? So we want to, there's this balance, there's this balance in our horse's emotional state and their mental state in regards to training that can be challenging to find. And I, my experience tells me that skilled trainers, trainers who um, have a lot of experience or get the assistance that they need to achieve these things. So learning from other experienced trainers are much more likely to have this result with their horses. And just like you're going to find with any kind of training where you need assistance, 
to f help you know like figure out how to achieve that balance right so I can talk all day long about balance and we can listen and read books and listen to podcasts to talk about you need your horses the horses need to have emotional and mental balance it's great how do we achieve it and that's where the guidance is really helpful finding a trainer that understands this and not only understands it knows how to apply it in their training and in their um, everyday interaction with their horses and so this is where I find it's really important to watch the people you want to learn from not just a couple Instagram clips I'm not talking about that I'm talking about either going and observing them going to a clinic watching you know longer footage maybe taking a course of theirs and really watching the footage that you're seeing and not just a, just taking it all and at at face value like really reading it watching it is our word are the words matching the training what are the horses behavior what's the behavior of the horse telling you about that training experience and that's the real judge right there right the horse is the one that tells us what they think about the training and we need to be watching them before we listen to anybody's words about how that horse is feeling, right? So we need to really understand equine behavior and body language so that we can be the most effective and ethically minded trainers possible and also be savvy as far as figuring out the trainers we want to learn from. Because you may not know how to achieve an emotionally balanced horse or a horse that has you know like their body language and everything expresses just a general positive but relaxed way of being and an eagerness without being frantic you may not know how to achieve that but if you're aware of equine body language and you've studied it you can recognize it when you see it and then you say I want to learn how to do that I'm going to learn from that person so I feel like I say so a lot but hopefully you guys will forgive me I'm kind of multitasking as I'm talking here and I feel like I'm on all these kinds of tangents I'm trying not to be but, um, yeah, so balance. So the emotional balance, and then we're talking about behavioral balance, so balance between the stationary and the movement behaviors. And then we're talking about balance in the training, so in informal and informal training sessions, just spending time with their horses and then spending time in training sessions and then outside of training sessions. So they we have a balanced relationship with our horses where they're not always expecting it to be this like you know structured training session but we're also you know it's more than just a hangout session and you, it doesn't have to be more than a hangout session if honestly that's all you ever want to do with your horse then go do that that's awesome um, you may find I feel like it would be the best to make sure that the horses at least have basic care abilities like being able to deal with a vet in a positive way have their feet trimmed without it being stressful you know things like that but once you achieve those basic care things I personally don't find any problem with the horses just chilling in their pasture and you just spending time with them I think that's great I think it's fantastic I wish more people would do it with their horses um, their horses don't have to work they don't have to have a job I think that's a just an idea that has that is a little bit archaic it's a little out outdated <laughs> um it's it's a hangover it's a hangover from back when horses were our form of transportation and they were machines and now they then they became sports equipment when they their job is our transportation got replaced and now then they became sports equipment and now we're starting to realize that they can be companions too they don't have to just be equipment right so um yeah, so balance in those areas I find is really helpful in having a strong relationship with your horse, an effective training experience, and also um, a healthy training experience. So your horse is not just performing a million tricks and a superstar at all that, but also, um, but also can just hang out and do nothing and and enjoy your company and you can enjoy their company so the last kind of balance topic related topic that I want to talk about is um, the balance between creating motivation for our horses so having a reinforcer of value enough that the horse is motivated to do X Y or Z right so creating value in the training and and you know creating that value behind the horse wanting to do what it is we're asking them to do because I mean let's just face it horses don't touch targets out in the wild they don't 
um, trot on cue out in the wild. They don't reverse round pen out in the wild. They don't jump jumps out in the wild. They don't do anything that we want them to do out in the wild. They eat, <laughs> they sleep, they procreate, they raise babies, and they survive. So if we want our horses to do anything, we have to create a, uh, a motivator for that, whether that's through a traditional approach with negative reinforcement or in possibly punishment um, or through positive reinforcement. And my personal approach is with primarily positive reinforcement. But like I mentioned before, with creating like the frantic horse, we can have too high of a motivator, too strong of a motivator to where the horse is so focused on find, getting the reinforcer and we kind of hold the keys to the kingdom. We hold the, the pot at the end of the rainbow, right? And we set our criteria too high and all of that. And then and we withhold the click and reinforce that can create frantic behaviors and extinction and frustration, all that. But even if we're not doing those things, if our motivator, the reinforcer is too high a value for that individual, that they um, will kind of go to the ends of the earth to do whatever it is they're asked and they will never say no because they want that food so desperately, then we've created an, an unbalance in their um, interaction in the training with their inter their mm, their level of motivation with the training. Um, I guess the best way to explain this is how I really approach this, where I want my horses to have like the autonomy, the choice to say no. So they, I want my horses to walk away from me if I ask for too much, if my criteria is sloppy, if I'm adding, you know, criteria too fast, if I'm lumping or if I'm withholding the click and you know, whatever it is, whatever it is I'm doing where it's like bad trainer, don't do that. <laughs> um, when I'm not being the best trainer I can be. I want my horses to feel very confident in saying, you're being a bad trainer. And we're not talking about this big deal. We're just talking about a horse like going, eh, eh, I, I mean, I'll, I'll think about doing it, but you're, you're like, your reinforcer is inconsistent or it's not because it's kind of sloppy and I don't know when it's expected and your timing is off and like all that. It's just more, it, it's better it's better for me, like this is the horse speaking, right? It's better for me if I just walk over here and eat some grass in this field. Or I come over here and I eat the hay that you've offered. That you have this other reinforcer in the environment. You allow there to be this non-contingent reinforcer, which we could argue about that. There's always contingencies. But anyway, is non-contingent as possible where they can just walk over to it and eat it, right? They don't have to do anything for you to get it. They just have to walk over to it and they can just eat as much hay as they want. Um, I want my horses to feel confident walking over to that pile of hay and eating the hay and saying no to my Timothy pellets, let's say, which are arguably less, lesser than the hay that's available because the Timothy has a lower NSC level usually. And so like lower, lower sugar content and all that than the hay I usually offer, which is coastal. Anyway, um, I want my horses to feel really confident in walking away from me if I am doing a bunch of stuff that make them feel either like conflicted or frustrated or flustered or whatever other word you want to use where it's just in their best interest to go get reinforcement somewhere else. But if my training, if my motivator, so my reinforcer is way off balance with what's available away from me, they are much less likely to say no and they will put up with way too much from me and get frustrated and conflicted and flustered and angry and all these other things because what I have is too unbalanced, it's too off balance with everything else that's available to them and so they will not say no. They will not walk away. They will not go do something else because I have too much power basically. Like what I have has too much power. So this is really important to me when we're working with positive reinforcement that we make sure that our horses have other choices, but not just other choices, but almost of equal value other choices. And it doesn't have to be exactly equal, but it needs to be pretty dang close. 
And sometimes when I have a horse that I feel like won't say no to me, like basically won't walk away, won't do anything else, and it's convinced whatever's coming out of my hand is just gold and everything else is trash, it doesn't matter if literally what I have in my hand is trash. They think whatever I have in my hand is the pot of gold. Um, if I have a horse that's like that, I'll actually make the reinforcers that are freely available in the environment, so the grass or whatever, better than what I have. So I'll go train in a pasture full of green grass and I only have Timothy pellets. Well, hands down, the grass should be better, but they think that what, you know, training with me is better because a lot of times horses, well, there's a concept called contra freeloading where they actually find working for their food more reinforcing. Um, this is, happens across all species. But in particular, particular, I find that this happens when horses have been hand-fed a lot, like different treats and stuff, so they create this association with being hand-fed that it's a higher value, even if what you have at that moment is a lower value. So we have to take that in consideration, the learning history of what's coming from your hand. What does the horse, how does the horse think about whatever's coming out of your hand, regardless of what it is right now, what's their learning history with stuff that comes out of your hand, right? Um... So I will actually try and make the other stuff more reinforcing and I will even reinforce them for engaging with the other stuff. Like I'll have a pile of alfalfa, let's say, right at their feet and I'm feeding them by hand with Timothy pellets and if they go take a bite of alfalfa, I'm like, click reward, like give them all the food. <laughs> um, and this so shows them that engaging with the environment, engaging with other reinforcers and stuff also get the reinforcer they thought they wanted most or they think they want most. Um, and maybe they do almost. So it's a balancing game, finding a, a balance. I'm going to use balance a million times because that's this podcast's topic. It's a balance, balancing act, finding that sweet spot of the reinforcement that you have versus what's available in the environment so that your horse doesn't become frustrated and that they will opt out if necessary. I would like my horses not to opt out ever because that means I'm being a good trainer, but I want them, I want to know that they will if I'm being a terrible trainer. And some of my horses are really good at this because I've raised them this way. And like my Philly River, like if I'm being a sloppy trainer, she's like, peace out lady, like I'm done. Like I'm not dealing with this BS today. And she just will go eat some grass and she'll come back in a few minutes. She's like, are you ready? Are you ready to be a good trainer today? And it's like, she's talking to a kid, but although I'm totally making up because obviously she doesn't say anything because I'm going crazy, but she, um, she's really good at this. She has a, she's very confident in her choice. She's very confident in the reinforces in her environment versus what I have. Um, and you know, in certain situations where I have to have her focus, where she can't go anywhere else, where there isn't a choice, like, let's say that, um, let's say that we're at a vet clinic, right? And she has to stay on her leader up and she has to stay with me and it's not safe for her to go anywhere else. I will up the value of what I have. I will bring in carrots. I'll bring in whatever I need so that she's like, oh dang, I need to stay with this human today. Um, in that, in, in those situations, I find that that is the better option than having to resort to either trapping her with me with negative reinforcement or correcting her for trying to leave me or losing, you know, possibly her getting, you know, doing something else and it getting, and it being harmful to her. So it's a balancing act with what you're training, what you're doing, where you are, what are the consequences if she were to get loose, you know, all these things. So a lot of my students are at boarding facilities maybe the walk to your arena from the stall you use some higher value reinforcers to combat the grass that's around the edges of the pathway that you're walking and you because your horse can't go loose and you do need to get them to the arena so you use higher value while you're walking over there and then once you're in the arena and you make sure they have some hay in the arena you make sure there's something available to them freely and then you find something of neutral value in your training so like a handful of timothy pellets and then they have timothy hay loose over here so you've got a balance right literally you have the same thing in your hand versus what's on the ground but again we remember that sometimes what comes out of our hand is naturally or more reinforcing um, for some horses not all some horses are actually afraid of hands and taking food from hands and so you what's in your hand is actually the least reinforcing because of the fear associated around that or they've never been taught to eat from your hand and so that's a whole nother topic 
Um, so it's again, it's about the individual, it's about the situation, it's about finding that balance for that horse and for that situation. It's going to be different for every horse. It's going to be different for every situation. This is kind of the art. This is a really good example of the art of horsemanship, the art of horse training, especially and with our plus training in particular in this circumstance. I can quote you science all day long. I can quote you protocols all day long and recipes and all of that. But at the end of the day, it comes down to the finding, you know, taking all that information and putting it into, you know, putting it together to become this masterpiece and this balanced masterpiece for that particular moment, for that particular horse with their own individual learning history and your own individual skill set and your particular set of goals for you and for this horse. And this is why it's really good to have a coach too, because they can help you with this process because it sounds well, actually, I don't even know that it sounds that easy, but it's, it, it can be, once you're used to it, it can become really like it's like a smooth process. You just like, you know, this horse, you know, the situation and you just kind of go with it and it flows, everything flows, but there's some trial and error that goes into it and that's okay. It's totally okay. I've sometimes accidentally brought out reinforcers that are too valuable to an individual horse and it's created some frustration and I just end the session. I'm like, all right, I need to go back and get something lower value and we work with that. And it's not as complicated as it sounds either. Um, you know, 99.9% .9 of the time I work with an alfalfa Timothy pellet mix and that's works for almost every horse. And then what I do is I change the environment that I'm working in to help with that situation. So like if I have a horse that is, uh, finds what's coming out of my hand, like super exciting, then I offer them alfalfa. But if they don't really find what, if they find what's coming out of my hand, like interesting, but not like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. This is candy. Then I'll have like hay available or some older grass, like I'll work in their pasture or whatever. Um, so that's kind of, and then, and you can prepare your horse. You can prepare your horse to be in other environments where there are more reinforcing, um, things out in the environment. So like working over grass for a horse that's not usually on grass. And then you can continue to train with just a Timothy or alfalfa pellet. And it's adequate for that situation because you've prepared that horse for that distraction level. So they'll stay focused with you. And they won't disengage unless there's like a serious problem with the training. Um, so yeah, I kind of went on a bunch of little tangents and I don't, I don't know how helpful this episode was to be honest, but I hope that it gave you some food for thought. If that's all it did, then I'm good with that. Balance is such a, that term can be used for so many things. And that's kind of where I was getting at is you can find balance within behaviors. You can find balance within reinforcers and motivations, like, you know, what's motivating your horse. You can find balance within the time you're spending with your horse training versus, you know, just casual time with your horse, n no expectation time. Um, you can find balance within your horse's emotional state and mental state. So how they're feeling about the training and it's not that they're insane and wrapped up in this like tight little, you know, knot and like performing behaviors left and right. I mean, that's not a balanced horse. The horse is out of control and stressed and anxious and we don't want that. But we also don't want a horse that's just could care less and is just completely unmotivated to do anything and or fearful or angry or whatever. We want to find a good, healthy spot for their emotional mental state. So we could call that balanced, right? Um, and then you could talk about balanced in your humans too. I mean, in the human, in the trainers, we need to be balanced in all of these areas as well. You know, a trainer that is, I, I've, when I have students, I guess I should say, when I have students, I try and you know, when, especially like interns and stuff, when they come for like six weeks at a time, we spend a lot of time bouncing between, you know, let's do a little bit of ridden stuff. Now let's go back to the ground and work on stationary behaviors. Now let's work on some leading behaviors. Now let's work on some more like teaching horses to turn to a rain cue. And so we bounce back and forth. It just goes back and forth. And that's kind of a natural consequence of them working with my horses and my training program where we do that, or we move back and forth. Um, but it, it helps balance out their training skill set as well. And we need to be balanced emotionally too. And this doesn't mean that we shouldn't feel emotion. It doesn't mean that we need to be dead robots either. 
or eternally optimistic. It just means that we need to be in a good frame of mind when we go into working with our horses. And if we can't or we're not able to that day, then we need to just take a relaxed day. And we need to have lower expectations of ourselves and of our horses and then just enjoy time with them. And that's perfectly okay. And then we need to be balanced in our expectations of our horses too um, in how you know we go about our training plans and our shaping plans. If we are so hyper-focused on training, let's say a stand stay, and we never even consider training anything else, then we're going to kind of paralyze ourselves into this little box where we have to get this behavior really, really perfect and, you know, and then we're going to teach our horses to only ever stand still. So if your training approach includes the idea of balance in your horse and teaching both stationary and movement behaviors, and then you're naturally going to find that you're more balanced in your training program because you're training your horse and it's just a cycle. <laughs> um, it's a circular thing, circular reasoning. Uh, and, um, yeah, and, 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 you know, also you could find even, you could talk about the, our motivation too with training. A lot of equestrians really enjoy riding stuff. Um, but I think it's really healthy for us to also learn to find value in stuff on the ground and spending time with our horses on the ground and making that fun and exciting for the horse and for ourselves as well. Um, and then a lot of people want to just spend no expectation time with their horse, which is great, except for if your horse doesn't know how to stand for the farrier or do any type of medical care stuff, cooperative care stuff, then we're off balance again because our horse only knows how to hang with us and doesn't know how to actually engage and interact in our, our in the world where they need to have medical care and then you're going to find yourself in a situation where it's dangerous and stressful for both you and your horse and for whichever care provider you have at that time so we need to find a balance in that as well just you know move you know finding um where the areas are off balance you know maybe we're spending a lot of time working on those cooperative care of stuff, but we never spend time just hanging with our horse or, you know, vice versa. So again, I could go on and on and on and many, many more tangents about this, but I think maybe this will give, you know, just some food for thought and help you when you're thinking about working with your horse or just spending time with your horse and just being aware of what that time consists of, what are, what are our expectations of our horse? What's the criteria? How is our horse's behavior? Like, what are they expressing to us behaviorally about how they feel about the training situation? What's their mental state? Can our horses stand still? And can they also move? Um, cause yeah, anyway, I could keep going on, but so yeah. So I hope that this episode was helpful in some way. And I'd love to hear back from you if you have any food for thought from me or any feedback or how this has helped you out. And I am always open to suggestions for future episodes. If you want to add anything to my list of growing ideas, I'd love to hear from you. And maybe I'll do a part two on this eventually where I talk about more things that are about balance and, um, so yeah, go out and have fun with your horse. Try not to get too stuck in one area or another. Find that balance, and I will talk to you guys in the next episode. Thanks so much for listening. If you'd like to find out more, head to my website, thewillingequine.com. On there, I have a really extensive blog. I'm a very prolific writer. And I also have a an FAQ page. And the FAQ has all kinds of things. It has questions and answers about training and about my training specifically, as well as just general about working with positive reinforcement. There's also sections on there about health and um, behavior. So all of that. I'm also on a lot of different social media platforms, Instagram, YouTube, Facebook. So check those out and I'd love to hear from you. So don't hesitate to email or send me a message.